I'm The Voice, and this is a Divi community-produced video from the Foundation. I'm here today with Neegs and Rob. Neegs, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, how's it going? I'm happy to be with you. How's it going, Rob? I'm doing good. I'm happy to be here and talking about all this stuff. It's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. We're going to be talking about a new model that we have for these spaces and podcasts and videos that we're going to be doing. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. And it's going to happen, we hope to talk about it, but about every two weeks. We're just starting with this first segment. And this segment is really to highlight the new model that we're taking with those videos. So the idea is to get at least one every two weeks to make sure that it is cut in maximum 10, 15 minute segments. So it is easily approachable for everybody. We can talk about why did we take these decisions and also uh, what would be the limitations of that because obviously we'll have some issues with some of the model to make it fit when we get guests or when we have other type of discussions that go a little longer maybe it will take the form into spaces uh, what do you think guys for me it works way better i think this works way better because most of the podcasts i'm listening to now there's this new long form, which we're actually approaching here, that's kind of out there. If you listen to Lex Friedman or Huberman or whatever, but they have tables of contents because I'm not interested in all of that. <laughs> and what's nice about this, by doing this in segments, anybody who's listened to me or voice know that we end up being loquacious and you can skip over the stuff you don't like. Um, so for me, like number one, that's why this is a, a better format for this. Mm -hmm. Are we still, still going to have... Uh, sorry, go ahead, Vice. I, I was just going to ask, are we still going to have the um, sort of off the cuffs every once in a while? Because sometimes when we kind of get a topic and we just want to throw that out there, we'll still have those too, right? So the idea is to have um, the minimum those uh, video audio updates, ah. but then we'll have on top of that, we can have any time to have the cuffs. They won't necessarily be on Thursday. They can come really unplanned. Those videos that we're doing is really to update everyone, inform them on our current product line mm -hmm. and inform them on what's coming. Basically, we really want to make sure that we highlight our current products. And so we really want to put in front of everybody what is the strength of our offering and then where we are going and what we will be offering to the whole industry in the month and years to come. Yeah, I'm absolutely looking forward to guests like that'll be fun. Yes. We're not going to do it for a while, yeah. but that'll be fun. That'll be awesome. This is our first video, so um, our first recording, not necessarily video, but we, we could have some video with it. Um, since this is our first, what are some of the things that we're starting to address in this segment? What, what do you think should be some of the topics we'll have? So this video will be a little longer than this new model really intends to be. We really wouldn't want to go beyond 30 to 45 minutes for mm -hmm. those for this format. However, there are a ton of things that we want to address for this first big segment of videos. We'll address mm -hmm. the foundation update, the recent changes with uh, DV Labs focusing on the business side of things, and then DV Foundation regaining a voice and uh, needing everybody to help move forward like a really strong decentralized project. And so we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the blockchain industry and how DV Core started. Um, do you want to talk about that a little bit, um, Rob? Yeah, we'll talk about that. We'll get into some of the technology about side chains and that kind of stuff and the basics. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. I hope I can not just go down rabbit holes with the with the technology. That's actually the part that interests me. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't. I'm not necessarily a big player like in the markets of various things. I do like understanding what other things are doing. I'm looking forward to that kind of stuff in the future, but for now, I think we're just going to head into, you know, what makes us unique, uh, what will make us even more unique and better uh, in the future, and then we'll, you know, get into some examples as to why. I, I like all that. Fantastic, fantastic. So why don't we start off with um, probably the biggest topic I can think of, which is Divi Project, but now foundation the divi foundation and the recent changes and it's really kind of a restructuring of everything but it's a recovery of what the original vision was 
Okay, so what about those changes? Um, so the initial idea is to actually get back to the roots. The idea is that DV project is the blockchain, it is the coin, and it is extremely important that it has its own path forward. And DV Labs is a development company that has been helping a lot DV for a few years, but it is also important that it continues its path forward. It will focus on the business side while DV can focus on the blockchain and it can focus focus on make its technology adopted um, basically by all audience. That's really the idea about that. And we need multiple companies like DV Labs. We have the sidechain company, right? That will help us later. Um, this company is not DV Labs. It's a completely different company and, and it will help DV grow. We need many like that. What can you add to that, guys? I guess the only thing I would add is you mentioned the path and then you said returning to roots. I don't think we're returning. I think we're on that path. The thing I got into all of this for was, you know, we, we had national nodes back then. We're empowering staking vaults going forward. It was kind of like the whole thing was about participating in this and making it better. And I think that's the path we've always been on. We're just kind of not going back to roots, but continuing along that path. It's just the way I see it. Well, I think I agree. It, essentially, when I got on board, of course, early on, the whole goal was a philosophy that was under the development guidelines of making it easy. But ultimately, it was always because being in crypto and being part of the blockchain meant that we as community members were in charge. The developers build stuff, but we guide the whole entire project and it and it takes our involvement so and that was the goal originally um and i think that uh, that's what we're just honoring we're completing that yeah i think that's exactly what we're trying to do and the fact that dv labs um, helped us a lot and really was the focus of the dv project for a moment obviated the importance of what DV was achieving technically. That's yeah. also why we're here, Rob, Voice and I, we're really here to basically help the project uh, become a more decentralized project with a much wider impact that it's currently having. And for this, the foundation needs to become a tool for people to basically integrate this technology to develop around the DV blockchain. And that's really why we're here. So uh, we can talk a little bit about our background. Let's spend a minute talking about ourselves. We hope we've got new people in the community. Maybe some people don't have any idea who we are. And many people probably don't even know our backgrounds. Like, why are we even here? Or why, why are we qualified to do this? So I'll start. My background, well, I'm Robert. My last name's Hirsch. But my background has, uh, since college, has always been startups, since my very first job out of college. I spent 13 years in college because uh, <laughs> I'm really dumb. Uh, no, I, I got a couple of degrees. I left engineering school with a PhD in mechanical engineering, so went straight and only worked in startups from there. I started my own thing, uh, developing a, a GPS watch before they were in watches. So this is the 90s. I am 55 in case people don't know. Um, and then from then I just worked into in alternative energy, fuel cells, hydrogen pumps, and I had one stint at a company that did X-ray fluoroscopy. Um, so all startups and kind of all engineering, uh, moving up into managerial roles. And then I just stopped in 2014. Um, Bitcoin became a big part of my life. And then I was just going to be Bitcoin. And then 2017, 18 came around and I got pulled <laughs> in every, di which, every different direction. Um, and got into a few things. But the only thing I really got involved in, uh, like with my hands, writing code, talking to community members, is really Divi. Um, all the other ones, I just put some money there and saw what happened. Um, that's the overview of my background. Nick, do you want to give it a shot? Sure. I'm in Switzerland, in Geneva. So I started as a, a school that is basically an equivalent to a bachelor. I reached a major international company, one of the biggest company in, in the world. And I really reached there as a financial analyst. A few years later, I joined TV Labs and DV. I initially started to help voice because in fact, I was a DV holder. I really liked the initial project from Jeff and Nick, and I was really interested by the DV offering. 
And in fact, I was seeing voice helping everybody. It was seemingly 24 seven for me. And I just started to help him a little bit. The more I started to involve into DV, the more things I started to see that I could help on. In the end, I ended up kind of most of the operation right now for DV Labs. I also helped DV Labs go through 2023 and reduce the operational cost by more than 80% and be in a stable position for 2024 moving forward. Uh, well, what about you, Voice? I gotta say. I think that's great. I, I I know most of the community knows me and they kind of have an understanding of my background. I've, uh, of course, come from many different kinds of industries, none of them technical from the standpoint of computers and and uh, uh, just completely self-educated. So there's a reason why I can answer many questions regarding business or sales or even unloading trucks. I've done pretty much everything you can do. My journey began almost, wow, 13 years ago in crypto. And the reason why I got involved in crypto is totally 100% based upon what I believed, the freedoms that it should give us as individuals, the the sovereignty of our assets. So I'm very motivated in that purest aspect of freedom-based uh, decisions and, and those kinds of things, which is another reason why I'm very, very proud and very, very happy that we as a community are, are fulfilling the destiny of moving towards governance. We, that's our kind of our business background, to, you know, like why we're we're okay to help uh, move Divi along. But what do you guys like doing? Like when you're not head down in Divi, what do you guys do? I'm always head down in Divi. <laughs> True. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's the I think that's the main thing. No, realistically, I also I, I just spend time with my friends, have very long conversation about things. I don't really like much going into pubs and things like that. Um, I mostly receive people at home, and then I go out. I have a really wonderful dog, so I really go out a lot. But other than that, it's really very much DV. No, it's funny. I uh, I have the opposite view. <laughs> I mean, I've got some good friends, of course, but uh, you know. I, Socializing is not my thing, and I, everything I actually do, like people know, I do triathlons. Those are very individual events. <laughs> I don't do. I also live in Puerto Rico, so most of my friends. I moved here five years ago, and culturally, uh, I have not acclimated as well as I would have liked. And most of my friends are actually still back in New York. That's the the person of Robert, not just on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about what's our role in in this situation, what we want to accomplish at trying to lead um, the foundation towards this transition, right? Absolutely. Um, one thing that's clear is that besides the help that DV Labs and Nick have been offering to DV Project for all those years, it is very important that project grows beyond that with more people. So sure. this is really what we will help do. We really want to strengthen the position of DV in the market and make it more interesting for everybody, for people who are using the coin, but also for builders who are building around it, for people who are talking about it. I think this is really the role of the foundation and the previous structure wasn't enabling that. Like for us, our duty is helping DV uh, move back to that model where it is a lot more open to everyone who wants to work with it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you hit the nail on the head. And I don't know if it's exactly us guiding another company, although, or another developer or another person build, but it's empowering our community to do those things. Because again, Neegs is only one person. Rob is only one person. I'm only one person. It's about empowering each of us to do those things. There should be helps along the way to help every single person bring another person in that's going to be building and doing those things. The governance is part of that. There should be some value and ownership taking that responsibility and making those decisions, but again, sharing those things um, and making it happen as individuals, not just an individual. Yeah. Yeah, I don't look at it, like when you said that at first, Niggs, I kind of like, what are our roles? Like, I kind of like, I was kind of thinking of uh, you do this and I do that. And it's not like that at all. No. It's, uh, we are 
for people. I don't think we have a particular role. I think we are volunteering to help execute things that need execution. Correct. That's one of the reasons for the DAO we'll get to later. But, you know, we've got our heads down in this stuff. We have for years. And our main role is if the community wants to pursue this thing or fund that thing, get us on a new exchange, whatever it is. We're just here to provide the glue to make those things between the want or need and the action happening. That's essentially what we're doing. Yeah, glue is probably the best example. The community itself provides the grease. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think this is critical, right? Because a lot of people just get into blockchain and coins and they don't really understand the technology or the concept and, and they're not really interested into growing the project. They probably ignore the project are not made by a central team who yeah. builds everything. That's not how projects work. It's really, you have a core team. It follows the white paper goals, mm -hmm. basically. Then beyond that, uh, the whole ecosystem is built by people, people who are around, who are interested by this technology and have ideas about how they can leverage it with their own business. And, and that's how things grow, because if it had to be built by the same company, it would cost hundreds of millions to be able to reach the same kind of ecosystem that you can have around Bitcoin. This doesn't mm -hmm. happen because of one company. This is where we can help. We can help provide documentation, integrations. And I think this is where we can help DV be more attractive for everybody. And obviously the, the side chains is the major change with which DV will become ahead of basically everyone. We'll be able to talk about what is existing in terms of side chains in the next segment. And also what are the DV side chains, how they are different, how our offering is basically much better than anything that is currently in place. And that will offer so much opportunities to developers and businesses, then it will be a lot more important than to have a foundation that is capable of working with multiple partners right. and not just following the track We only of have one. one company that's building, let's just say in general, like the blockchain, and it only has one visual representation. It's a narrow vision. Your the way you see everything, that pair of glasses, everything is seen through those glasses of that individual. When the blockchain is very flexible, the blockchain may have lots of features, the blockchain may have lots of functionalities, but when one person is building, when Rob is building, he sees one thing that he would like to build on the blockchain and how he's going to uh, make that come to fruition. When I see something on the blockchain, I have a different idea how to build something. I may want a different you know, feature or function that's going to represent the goals of whatever the app I'm producing. And Neeks would have something different. We should be empowering everyone to be able to build out anything they want. There should be many visions and it's, it's the blockchain itself should never be one person's vision. It should be whatever you would like to build out on that blockchain that makes it possible. Divi is what you see it as being. Yeah, it's um, like, you know, we have ideas and we, we're willing to do this work, but we don't have all the ideas. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I don't know every single thing uh, that we can do to make this better or where we can deploy it. Or like, I had some ideas, like I did that bike thing, but that's, you know, that's <laughs> just one thing I could do. Just when one thing. Lots of yeah, when we have lots of people doing things, uh, you know, it just it just gets more lively, more it's vibrant. More and more and more, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the DAO because DAO at the center good, yeah. of this effort will be the DAO. So again, I'll refer to you the articles that have been posted on the blog. I really recommend that you read them if you didn't. Yeah. But basically we go in detail about the place that the foundation is going to take next, the place of the DAO moving forward, the financial situation, the opportunities. We basically go in depth into that. And it's not the last time we'll talk about it. The DAO will become really a central point on how a big part of the things that are done by the foundation move forward. I like to call it the proto DAO, and that sounds dismissive. It's not a dismissive statement. The proto DAO is just the beginning of what will eventually be the future of the DAO. So this DAO is important for you to participate in. When I say proto, it may just be how it operates, or maybe it's the 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 technology behind it. 
that doesn't matter. This is about your governance and participation. I can't stress any more than read the blog articles that Neeks just mentioned. And Rob had a big hand in writing. Read those articles, understand it, see how you can get involved and drive. Even if you're not building it, help someone else build something on it. Participate in that DAO. Your voice is a, is so important. I can't even give a, a measurement to it. Everybody's important in you the community. You were saying proto DAO. That is because the DAO is not is not built yet, right? Uh, we actually have a pretty ambitious idea of the the final form we want the DAO to take. And Rob has been an amazing leader in getting this thing forward. And maybe Rob, you can you can tell us a little bit more yeah, about yeah. the kind of things that we want to have and what you went through to try to find a model and, and the current effort that is that is ongoing. Yeah. So I'll start in the beginning, which is about a year ago which was Nick and some others said, hey, you know, we should have a DAO. Um, and it's true, we should have had one since the beginning. I wish we did, but it was very simple to begin with. But we really wanted a way for users and community members to have effect, even a year ago, a direct effect on the direction that the DAO takes. So, yeah, you know, I just did, there's some tools out there that are available for everybody for voting and so forth. And I kind of just strung together Discord plus uh, this thing called Snapshot, plus the fact that we had made an Ethereum token representing Divi so I could use the voting mechanisms that were on Ethereum. But, it, you know, it's clunky. I think one of our one of our community members thanked me on one of the uh, spaces that we had, and he was totally right. It's just like getting from nothing to participating in the DAO is a nightmare. I, I wrote an article to do it and really want people to participate in it. But the friction to get from here to there is way too high. And that's why voice calls it a proto DAO. The other reason I think it's a proto DAO is that I'm the only, I'm taking suggestions from people to put up to vote and so forth. So I am either intentionally or unintentionally acting as a filter there. And when something goes, I'm the one who does it. Like there's no, there's no decentralization in our DAO. So it's just a prototype. Moving from there though, and the, the, that, the vote that went up last was really, let's level it up. Let's make it so it uses Divi. It doesn't require Ethereum. It's kind of one bot for everything and it's easy to get into and out of. Once we have that, then we can get to a place where the decentralization is happening. You guys are using your vault to qualify to be in the DAO. Then once you have that, then it's autonomous. You guys can propose whatever they want. You know, community can propose whatever they want. They can vote on each other, tell each other this is an awesome idea or a terrible idea, whatever. All of the goodness of the DAO can happen once we have that. But uh, I got to get it built and I got to get it funded. Those are the, that's what's happening now. So that's the big thing is that when I, I don't needle it, I don't nitpick it. I think you nitpick it more because of course you have a vision for what the community can really have. Um, this DAO is still a learning journey. If you can learn this DAO, if you can understand this DAO, if you can teach this DAO, if you understand the um, intricacies of this DAO, Divi's DAO is going to be smooth sailing. You're still going to have some curves. It will still be made crypto made easier, right? When we finally get there, but that's still going to be a journey. That's not a goal. That's still a philosophy. So learn this now. And that centralized aspect is how it's hosted or how it's stored. It's not your votes. It's still a distributed, decentralized community that's coming together that's voting. It's where it's managed that may be centralized. So don't let those two terms confuse you. The ultimate goal for us is to have a complete infrastructure in a decentralized way, which is what Rob is talking about for the future. Your vote has value. Don't miss out on voting. Don't miss out on participating in the DAO. Get into the DAO learn the DAO and teach somebody else. There's one more thing that's important about DAOs is that um, they're supposed to change. Yeah. Like a static DAO is death. And so we're going to implement the governance methods that we voted on last summer. And it's highly likely it'll be wrong. It's our first shot. And I like the qualification methods we have. But we put in quorum ideas and we put in a bunch of other stuff that may make it impossible to move forward. I don't know. Maybe they're right. Uh, but having a DAO allows you to change the DAO, change the rules of it, change the way it looks, as long as people are willing to do it. 
So even when we get this first one up, which I think will be a breath of fresh air uh, and really invite a lot of people to get in on it, you can change the, not just propose things that you want to go do with Divi, but you can actually change the DAO itself. Uh, so it should be yes. a living, breathing kind of uh, application for, for Divi, which I, I really like about it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's really that's really critical to be able to offer for the community some place, some place on the table to take decisions moving forward. There is actually a, a current effort to be able to have an alpha website. So obviously we will be far away from the final product, but it would already be better than it is now. It would already be easier than it currently is. Yeah, it won't require Ethereum. It may not be the look and feel. It may not have all the things, all the governance aspects that we put in it. But it'll be it'll be with Divi. To, to it'll start be out with Divi. Yeah. <laughs> That's really nice. Well, everything the foundation, everything we as a community should want, should be focused on building on utilizing the features and functions, or creating new features and functions that we want to see that benefits everyone in the blockchain that's supporting the blockchain. It should always be focusing on Divi native blockchain first, and then of course, extending out everywhere on other chains after, mm -hmm. but Divi should be our ultimate focus for everything. Uh, totally agree. So this alpha website is currently open for raising funds. There is an address, it's $5,000. Maybe you can give us more detail about it. Oh, Ron. sure. Um, the $5,000 will get us from here to there for that site. I can actually start working on it with, with less so we can get the first review of it for everybody, see how they like it, move forward. That $5,000 is what is going to get to the end. Um, it'll, it'll be in a couple phases. You know, you'll, right now, um, it'll be, it'll include the, like the first phase will include things like the voting, which is the most important but the effort tracking might be later the quorum the uh, out of the governance the nft parts which is important it's critical um that's how we're validating who, who can provoke us and vote that might come in later um but just getting a replacement for a snapshot would be a huge win because that gets us off ethereum so it, it comes in it'll be a process i'll probably document the whole process once and so people Sorry to interrupt you. So people could make proposals. They wouldn't have to go through you, right? Um, I don't think we can do that until the NFT part is in there. Um, so the, that, that, okay. that's the part that makes it unspammable. So that's the part I'm worried about. That's why the NFTs are important. So we had a long conversation about who qualifies. We don't want it spammed with nonsense, but we want everybody to get in on it in one respect or another. And it was really owning a, a, a staking vault, which is what came out to be the best way to kind of serve access, uh, but also prevent the spamming. And for that part to get in, that's when anybody can get in on it. The first phase will just have, do you own Divi? And then, it, but it'll still act the way we have, but you don't need to do the, the transfer, the expensive transfer uh, to getting uh, e you know, uh, Ethereum Divi. Uh, and do the whole thing on a different platform and so forth. So it'll it'll be a lot better, but it won't have all the governance. That's already a great step. So please, guys, uh, take a look at the article. We'll post an article on the blog. You will be able to read some details about this offering. Please help us get through that and get this website soon so that we can we can move forward with the DAO. Great. Okay, so now let's talk about how Divi started, right? We actually had a great conversation with our engineer to be able to go through all those steps. And it is a complicated thing, but in fact, it is also very reflective of all the industry. We'll be talking about lack of resource, uh, the quality of the code base, the fact that multiple people interact. So we can talk about how, how it works in blockchain and maybe open source projects in general. So voice, maybe you're very familiar with. Can I just interject one thing? I'm sorry, because I find sure. this, I find this hilarious. So Divi raised two mil two million dollars, as I recall. Two and... point six, I think. Okay, yeah. two point six. Even if I said twenty, <laughs> they, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Um, but two, two point six, and and you said this is like indicative of the of the blockchain industry. But I keep remembering like EOS four. What was it? Was it really four billion? Billion dollars? It was. It was a bazillion. Yeah, but it's one in a thousand. No, right? no. I mean, during that time frame, yeah. you either died, 
and and closed your ICO, or you had a 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or a billion dollar ICO. In fact, if you look at the ranks, the ICO ranks, 2.5 is among the top 100 at that time. Oh, uh, sure. If you mean, if you look at, at a histogram of all the, I'm just saying, yeah, and you're right. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. It, it, it is indicative of most of the industry. But at the time, uh, there are these multi-billion dollar projects that are literally, literally nothing right now. Like literally of <laughs> unbelievable. Course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. But yeah, so you're right. So yeah, most of the of the industry was like Divi, but it's just during that time, there were these overpowering, well-funded projects that really <laughs> didn't produce much. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for sure. So it was more to talk about like the more common projects, right? Um, yeah. Actually, Divi did actually pretty good, but uh, at this time, there was also... Like this is also something we can talk about that is very common in all blockchain projects, is that the history of DV is full of bumps, right? So some of the founders disappeared very early. Some of the founders disappeared very early. Jeff actually helped the project go through the first bear market, which happened just a few months after, after the release. Those 2.5 million are actually not really what the project had, especially that a lot of it had been collected on Ethereum. And again, this is something you will see in almost all the crypto projects. If you don't have key people, uh, then projects die. That, that's how many projects in crypto die. And that's how we, we did survive. Yep. So to get into the technicals, um, basically we have our blockchain engineer who has been at the head of all those changes since, the, since almost the beginning. So he's random string. So random string has been here since I think almost five years. Yeah. And when he, when he found the blockchain, the DV blockchain, it was basically in the state that all the blockchains are today. It suffers the, the same weaknesses. It was suffering the same weaknesses as most of the open source projects you have a lot of people that are contributing to one thing. And then you don't really have one person thinking about the architecture, thinking about all those things would work together. Things are most likely strapped together and it is a lot harder to understand how they work. And one of the first goals that our engineers set was that he wanted this code to be understandable by a novice developer. Correct. He wanted the code to be you clear. Remember the, reason, the reason for that is because, you know, there's Bitcoin, like not all coins, but almost all of them, uh, you know, are forks or distant forks of forks of forks of, of Bitcoin. Uh, ours is in particular is, is a, a chain from Bitcoin to Dash to Pivx. And then to us and other projects forked along, forked off along that same path that we took. And, you know, Random Street once said to me, you know, he, uh, Satoshi was brilliant, uh, but not necessarily the best. Well, he coach. wasn't. So that's <laughs> the difference is that, that uh, I'll digress just a little bit. When you have an open source project and you invite people in to work on that project, that developer, that coder picks the one thing that they're focused on whatever's bugging them whatever's stuck and so then they fix that something or they build that something they take no concern for all the other codes surrounding it and then their concern is to make sure their feature and function works but when you think about code especially open source code which is still good or any kind of code in a company if you have 10,000 people touching your code or 200 people touching your code there's different philosophies for that code there, there's just different That's ways right. of doing it and it becomes a mess after a while, even if it functions, it becomes untenable or unmanageable or maybe not even understandable from a code base perspective. It functions, but there's no way to fix it, upgrade it or repair it until you really clean it all up. Yeah, and they, I mean, I, I'm not, I code, but I'm not a coder. Nobody pays me to code anything. Um, but, but I do look at even good code and i can read it but even then even when it's relatively good it takes me a very long time to go through it and understand what what's doing what especially if it's gone through more than one coder like you don't there's no person to go and ask what is this so we have we're four forks in 
band-aids things didn't work but there's you know their vestigial organs basically <laughs> are still inside the code um and that's what random string was up against and he has a he has a certain kind of ethic where what goes into the random string is definitely not what comes out of the random string like he, he wants to <laughs> take those materials and produce you know something that is organized that works together it doesn't have a uh, compute pointed at things that aren't necessary like all of that stuff so and he it was just happened to be the perfect person to get right. the divi Correct. code base. i would agree We'll talk about the mindset behind the ad the advancement that um, random streak changes. But just to for people to understand, because I think this is something that that's counterintuitive, is that Bitcoin and most of the blockchain code uh, that you can find in the industry um, initially it was a proof of concept. It was not intended to be a release level. And the thing is that things went forward. And as you can see, many other projects, even if they're not inherited from Bitcoin directly, it is a rush. And the quality of the code, the expandability of the code is never a priority in those models. DV was no different when uh, our engineers started to work on it. As Rob was mentioning uh, just before, he was really the proper person to, to get us where we are today uh, because really his vision was strong in the quality of the code, uh, understanding what it does and being able to use it for other purposes. And we'll also see that with the invention that he came with in the next section. Yeah. So that's what he kind of, and so you got to imagine he, he comes in, he looks at the code, you know, wants to vomit. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, yeah. spent years making one of the best code bases in this entire industry. It's not, and what's that, what's, what really sucks is that, that that's not sexy. Like that's not, I can say that sure. statement with confidence, um, but you know, it doesn't, you know, it, it's not pretty, you can't see it on the outside. It doesn't have a nice pattern, you know, <laughs> there's all these attributes to things that we find cool that are just simply not watching code. Correct. Uh, unless you are an engineer and you want to have to go work on that code, which is what we want. We want, we want people working on the code. Um, so that was basically what he did and, and he fixed it all. And in the fixing, you, now you can see the engine and you can see the transmission and you can see like, you can see these different parts. And now knowing the different parts, you can be smart about what you do next. Um, and that's really what he, what, I think that's what he really brought to this. The, the, our entire There's articles that. that if you haven't read that are in the blog that kind of details this. And there are some imagery that is shared in those articles at the divvyproject.org blog. And I think that there was uh, three, oh, is there are three articles total, correct? Um, the Yeah, the three yeah, articles. If you have not read those, just look at that first article and then think, Every other blockchain is that first article, nearly, not all of them. Some of them have started from scratch and really had a focus when they did it. But everybody who's been around for a decade or even less kind of is that first article. And they're all going through those changes. Some of them had to refactor. Some of them had to update, including Bitcoin, by the way, um, make those changes. But that's what made Random String so strong is he started so early on detailing everything, taking everything out and looking at it and then putting it back cleaner than what it was before. Um, read those articles. It's, it's helped us to get where we are today to make the, the magnificent, fantastic, almost unimaginable things that are coming for tomorrow possible. So I talk a lot with Random String about that situation. One thing that's really interesting and makes him really the, the man of the situation is his background is in algorithmic math. Yes. And he is really unbiased, but I would say he's a genius. Um, I think we will publish because he has a long text about his journey uh, from the first version of DV2 today. And I think we'll publish that in the That'd blog so that you can, you can see his mindset. He's really th someone who thinks uh, long-term, really careful about the security. Um, if there is 0.00001% chance of something, he would be like, hey, no, that's, that's no, not good. That's exactly, yeah. It was really interesting to, 
to have random string at the at the head of all that because it really helped us. So first of all, he took the time to detangle everything because this is one of the big problem in all those blockchain. Everything is entangled together. And if you start to touch one thing, you're kind of worried of what will happen um, on some other things that are connected to it. So one of the first big work that he had to do is detangle things, separate them properly, uh, making sure that the code actually reflects the behavior that he's trying to achieve. And by doing that, he was able to highlight some piece of code that were already present in the blockchain and repurpose them or improve them towards some faster operation or completely different kind of operation. One of those things is the master node deployment on mobile. When uh, DV Labs came with the mobile wallet, they basically were requiring the master node deployment to go faster. So it required some improvement and the great work that Herman had achieved in that part of the blockchain enabled him to change the way it was deployed with a new approach and improve that deployment process in five seconds. It basically didn't need to wait. It has been a big change and we also implemented that in the desktop wallet and it, it basically improved completely the instead of having to wait 15 minutes for your master node to be ready now you could just leave it out after five seconds and it would deploy without problem exactly another of the the invention was the staking vote why, why don't you talk about staking vote voice sorry i had to swallow i was just drinking some iced tea um I my apologies it's okay throw me under the bus um so staking vault staking vaults themselves being a cold technology it's still stands firmly upon random string and it comes with a story and that story is about concern for your divi your cryptocurrency how he came about it is is a journey unto itself but it was all about him and he knew that people in the community were doing a process which is not necessarily safe um, it was where people were deploying, let's say, a remote VPS, and in that VPS, they were putting their coins on that VPS, uh, and that in that VPS, it was running and it was hot, meaning its coins were in that um, remote server, and it was ha it's hackable. There's no question. It is it is the dumbest thing that the industry ever helped promote was remote hosting, and then. And then staking or, or mining the blocks on these remote servers where your coins and keys were all on it. He was thinking about that, but then he went on vacation. Uh, he left for a little while and he had a Raspberry Pi. I'm, I, I hope he doesn't get upset with me for telling the story, but he had a Raspberry Pi and he was concerned as he had the Raspberry Pi that if he's going on vacation or going away for the weekend, what if somebody got into my house? What if somebody what if somebody got my Raspberry Pi? Even though he was so concerned for security, even though he knew he had done all of his due diligence and that was probably impossible to happen, he still didn't have a good time on vacation because all he could think about was his Raspberry Pi. That in and of itself sent him on this journey after he cleaned up the masternodes codes and after he was you know, le listening and reading about different processes that were in crypto that were coming to be, that he realized that there was a way that he could build out vaults and vaults could be done in a cold process, meaning you could be on a Raspberry Pi, you could be on a remote server, like a master node is set up. You can actually set up this process so it's totally safe and cold as a coin owner. And that's where the vaults sort of come into being. It was for that journey as himself as it's represented for community members and seeing community members putting themselves in unsafe positions that's where vaults come into be there's lots of fruit that comes from that but vaults came into being just a hundred percent for the safety and security that they were cold yeah it's, it's one of my favorite parts of divi in fact um because of the, the functionality i know a couple of other uh blockchains have implemented something similar but yeah that, that's 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 true i think that there are other chains that do some sort of cold type of process like that the difference would be is the focus on the way he did it is he kept everything as far as the coin owner sovereignty in place you don't delegate anything you still own your vault your vault is still on your local machine it's through cryptography 
that's a that's a really complicated topic unto itself. It's through a little piece of code that allows this remote server to for actually the best way to say it is it's it allows you to supply that remote server with a little piece of code that allows that server to run as you mining blocks remotely. It's cold. It's really crazy how it works. It's very complicated. And anybody who wants to chat about it for an hour can set up a concierge with me, but I can diagram it and detail it and walk you through it. But it's crazy what he did. So it's never a delegation. Never a delegation. Yeah. And so uh, another result of, of those improvements on the blockchain are the subscriptions yeah. and, and basically also the direction to sidechains. So the subscriptions are still in beta. They've not been integrated in the wallet, but, but it is a groundbreaking feature. One of the things that's really interesting is Random String says that for improving the masternode deployment and uh, developing the staking vault, he actually didn't need to do much. What he actually says is that once things were cleaned up, uh, it seems extremely easy and obvious to do those changes. So um, it is very interesting. And in fact, it is one of the elements that puts the DV blockchain way ahead of much of the other projects. And of course, the technical aspect is definitely something that most of the people are less interested about, but it, it makes it a very good candidate to develop new things, to innovate on that blockchain because things are clear. Things are very safe. They are very clearly identified. So it's a lot easier to build. Agree. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about sites. I think, I think subscriptions are not appreciated, I have to say. <laughs> I think we so have to have an example it. of them, right? We have to have an example. People have to see yeah. subscriptions in action. Yeah. That's something that you and I have been promising for a long time, is seeing something in action. And I know we've been busy it on is. many we different make it things. Cool. We just need to set aside some time to show a subscription even if even if I could set up some sort of a server to show how those subscriptions work, I know it's complicated. Our our yeah. goal is to through the community and through governance is to make that subscription process crypto made easy. But even if it's not easy right now, there's no reason why we can't show it in action and then give the idea of how easy it can be once we get it done. Um, that would be great. Yeah. The problem is the current iteration of the subscription is, is a lot more complex. I, I would say it's not a user-facing feature. It's more a wallet developer feature. It needs it to is, be integrated yes. into wallets so that so that user can actually can actually use it and businesses can actually use it. It opens a huge realm of possibilities, uh, refounded purchase, some, you know, debit card for obviously leaving it to DV. It is a really interesting feature, but right now it's just, it doesn't get the love it should because it's basically not, not in the hands of the users, we can say. Exactly. I mean, for me, I mean, again, it's the thing I'm kind of focused on is this DAO, but like, honestly, a great use case for it is when a project is funded or whatever that it, it the funds go out as a subscription. It not wouldn't be not a big chunk, not a bunch of votes to make a another chunk go out. You just put it in a subscription, and you can always stop the subscription. It's, it's a perfect payment mechanism to in, integrate into the DAO later. It's, it's a super good use case in my head, but we need to get it actually in there. So I, I agree with you. We need to have demonstrating demonstrating treatable examples of it uh, going before it can be appreciated. But again, this is this is Divi, uh, as far as I know, Divi only, um, I, because it is not a custodial subscription. Every other subscription I see out there is really that's put right. a bunch of money somewhere and uh, you know that somebody ends up owning and then that person will release the money. Yay, it's a third per third party. The, here, the third party is the blockchain. It's well, anything that's different. on chain between two people is just between those two people it is not a smart contract that would be on an evm is between two people and whoever made the contract or the contract and so whenever i put my funds into something and say i'm going to do it for this even if it's in a dex right now if i'm going to do it for this i'm giving over my coins to the dex well what does that mean well what's the difference i'm giving it over to 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 a, a coinbase for that matter there's somebody somehow in control of something of that smart contract and and i'm not going to debate the fact that 
you can change keys or you can burn keys. You can do all sorts of multi-party computation. The fact is, is that it's either centralized or it's decentralized. You can make it difficult. You can make it hard. You can make it obfuscated. You can do all sorts of things and then say it's decentralized. But really, decentralization of a subscription or a DEX has to be on chain and it has to be out of the authority of anyone but the two parties involved. involved. It doesn't mean that intermediate solutions, right, where trust minimized solution and all that are not are not great. They're great. But we do cherish at DV, we do cherish the trustless and sovereign approach. We always have done. And for us, it is it is really important to be able to to bring those kind of features to to people who still want to remain sovereign with their funds. So subscriptions bring a lot of different possibilities, um, but this is just one thing that, that the DV blockchain has. And I propose we move forward to why, why DV is a good alternative today. How does it compare to others? Um, what makes it great? Yeah, I think we... We should do this. This is this is exciting. Like, I mean, the first and foremost obvious one is that there's no. It doesn't take me much to run a node. Yeah. Right. Like, just to compare it to other ones that I know of that I personally spent time looking at, like EOS was one, Ethereum is another, Polkadot was another. Um, if you want to run, if you yourself want to run your own node on these networks, you the equipment you need just. I mean, it's not like a Bitcoin miner. It's not that bad, but uh, you know, there's another example of high cost equipment required to run a node um, or a miner in that case. When we started, I was using a Raspberry Pi. Definitely gotten bigger. It's not the first tier VPS you, you, you can use to run it. Maybe you need the second tier, but it's super lightweight. Really, it's low cost yeah. to run these both on equipment uh, and operating costs. Um, so just that alone, now, there are other chains that, that qualify in the same way in, in those respects, but this is, makes it way more inclusive, way easier for anybody to just do it. Most people already have a computer. They can just run it on there. Um, that's, the, that's one of the huge benefits of, of, a Divi, uh, of the Divi blockchain versus other ones that are out there. There's other things too. I mean, that's right. But just to remain on the lightweight and efficient part for a second, um, one of the things that you can see if you if you want to run an Ethereum node, for example, one of the big thing is the storage. Those blockchains are bloated with tons of smart contracts, a ton of things, and. While this could have been a possibility on the DV blockchain, it was decided from the very initial time that it wasn't the right direction for the DV blockchain. Yes. We wanted, and especially random string again, wanted um, the staking and being able to run a node and verify their, the transactions, submit your own transactions to be Everyone, available to yeah. everybody. You don't have to spend a thousand plus dollar to like you have to run an Ethereum node. and to give you some context on the DVLab side, um, basically the infrastructure for the mobile wallet, it is reliant on uh, external nodes, right? It is a light wallet and it needs to be able to communicate with external nodes to be able to update the blockchain data, submit its transactions and all that. And so to be able to operate, of course, it, it wouldn't be realistic for DV Labs to run an Ethereum node, a BTC node, and then a Litecoin node. All those things would be a huge, huge cost. And so instead, we have to basically look into companies like Infura and BlockCypher. So they are blockchain data providers. They run dozens of nodes and, and they basically provide the data. For DV, we don't need that. We just connect to one DV node. Of course, it has a redundancy to make sure that it never goes down. But one DV node, it never gets locked. It can handle all the connections, all the requests that we have. And that DV node runs on a very small server. Um, if you compare that to, again, Ethereum and all that, that needs um, 32 core, 120 gigabyte of RAM, more than a terabyte of storage. I mean, th those are really just not by normal people. It, it's, it's, yeah, same with Solana, same with yeah. uh, Polkadot. I mean, those those are massive machines. 
it requires mass when it requires massive machines too it it removes the individual and then those individuals have to then partner or again you get into that conversation about delegation now you're taking your funds you're partnering with some company some group some organization maybe on chain maybe it's a friend you're now having to give your coins over to someone else where you can pull those funds together to create these nodes it 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 doesn't make sense this goes away from satoshi's original vision with the validator vaults that 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 we have today yes you need to have at least a couple of divi in there to make them work i mean to make them really start competing but that's not really that's not really the point you need to have a good amount to be able to have a reasonable level of participation and a reasonable level of expectation that you're going to mine a block within a reasonable amount of time. I mean, those are numbers you come up with. But the fact is, is it's easy to set up. It doesn't require a brand new server with 32 cores and whatever you said, Neegs, however many, I think it's many terabytes on some of them, depending upon the kind of nodes you have. You, you don't have to do that. It can be run on a reasonable device, reasonable cores reasonably obviously set up safely and securely something anybody can buy anybody can get a machine like this anybody can participate and deploy nodes like this it costs sometimes hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month for some of these other types of nodes and um whether you have a vault on desktop a vault on mobile or you do the vault yourself the 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 cost for participation if you're going to do some service that's offered to you that's an optional crypto made easy service or whatever service you participate in um it's not expensive it's not crazy it's not cost prohibitive so let's um, talk about those votes so yeah we talked a little bit about the technical aspect in the previous section but let's talk about why those votes are important why are they different compared to the rest of the industry so i'll start by the masternode before divi had masternodes and random string i actually discovered that those masternodes were creating some issues on the blockchain nothing that was highly critical but it was still impacting the stability of the blockchain and more than anything it was blocking improvement on the blockchain the side chains couldn't have been connected to DV properly with those masternode without risking some instability that that could have been repercuted on the side chain, which of course wasn't desirable. So those taking votes are it is really the best um, the best implementation of cold staking without any intermediary. So the user when they deploy a staking votes, the staking votes is a copy of themselves. No one has the control over the staker that is remotely deployed. And that staker is basically your clone and it is staking for you in that hosted environment exactly. that nobody has access to. So it is without any intermediary and it is basically the closest you can have from the initial vision that Satoshi had, where people would be able to secure their own transaction, they would be able to take part in their own network, and basically those taking votes allow that. And what we have seen with the masternode is that for something like almost five years, we had the masternodes and the staking option on Divi. And while the staking was definitely earning more for almost all the time, uh, we could see that most people were on masternodes. Why? Because masternodes were a lot easier. They were a lot yeah. easier to, to operate. They were a lot easier to deploy. For staking, you had to manage your, your desktop wallet. You had to make sure it was always running. It was always connected to the network, always updated. The masternode, you just deployed it and you could forget it. Staking vote offered the exact same comfort. They offer the exact same stability. And they even improve that ease of access because they're not limited by a tier. You can add and remove funds anytime you want. So it is really the easiest way for anyone to take part in any blockchain system. I agree with all of that. I, one thing that always crosses my mind is why isn't everybody doing this? Why don't we have you know 50,000 staking vaults? People seem to be happy with staking Ethereum weirdly or staking with, you know, delegation on Polkadot and Cosmos. 
And I think the thing is not just with random strings kind of outlook on improving the blockchain, providing this technology for staking vaults. I think the real issue is that people haven't been burned enough yet, maybe. They're using methods that have points of centralization that are both controllable by outside. Mm. I mean, they're, they're delegated and their funds are safe. Don't get me wrong. It's not a custodial system like, say, Celsius or whatever. It's, you know, those are viable methods. Their decentralization is important simply because the blockchains are safer when they're more decentralized, safer from control, safer from censorship, safer from the original group of devs attacking in one way or another. There's a thousand scenarios you can come up with as to why you want a more decentralized blockchain um, and you want full sovereignty of your funds. And I think just people aren't there yet. And I think we're going to see it going forward, right? As, as crypt, crypto and Bitcoin become more and more part of our entire economy, I don't think even normies doubt that anymore for the most part. They may not like it yeah. <laughs> for one reason or another. But I think as we start seeing more and more people wanting to get into their Solana and get into their hot coin of the day, I think eventually we're going to see where it hurts. And like Solana is a great example, actually, because, okay, you delegate your stuff there. Something bad happens and the whole chain somehow goes down for a couple of hours. Like that concept is so bizarre to me. There's no way I would rely as a business. I would rely on that particular chain knowing that it goes down. That's for sure. You know, somebody presses the stop button. Like it's insanity to me. That doesn't happen to all the chains. And I think if random string was here, I think it would add, if you want to make sure that you are looking at proper data, you are sending your transaction properly, then you need to have your own node. Yeah. It is the only way you make sure that the information you have is reliable and no one is getting in between you and the network. That's by running a full node. Yeah. And having a full node that is running on any computer is a major benefit compared to requiring ASICs like on Bitcoin, requiring big rig of GPUs to be able to to secure formerly Ethereum, but you still have a lot like that. Yeah. Um, you just need a normal computer with DVD. Yeah, never, never mind the fact that you can't you can't have a node if you have got thirty one point nine Ethereum. You know. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> You're like that's another huge barrier. That's true. <laughs> um, but yeah, now so so I, I think we just we haven't come to the place yet where the full sovereignty of your node, your funds, your control, uh, or your assurance that what you want to do with this, with the coins uh, happens. I think we just haven't gotten to that place and we will. And the most protected blockchains will be those that have technologies like this, where you are in full control. I agree. And so we're kind of at the beginning of that. And we just haven't really been able to shine and show that doing it this way is the right way. Everything else is kind of like flash and shine to me. <laughs> Smoke and mirrors. And I think you would always have that concept where the technology has to move forward, right? And so yeah. this is what you can see with DeFi and all the utility that has been found in the last cycle. It's basically that people want to use that blockchain technology. They want to build things and they don't want to be slowed down by some of the concepts uh, that are actually critical to the initial idea of blockchain. And again, it is actually a very important thing. We see that the industry is flourishing in those areas. And then you will have the actual trustless version, the actual sovereign version that will follow up. Those technology cannot go as fast as the innovation is coming. So the innovation will have to do some trade-offs on those critical things. But then as you wait and as project kind of go on those new innovation and, and try to find the trustless way, try to find a decentralized approach, that you will see that you will see those things rise. And I think that this is the, the best segue to, to start to talk about the side chains, because this is exactly what the side chains will bring to. I was going to gonna say the same thing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. I was going to say the exact same thing just now because it's perfectly relevant. One, there's a number, but one of the 
problems with the architecture of things like Ethereum, Solana, and chains like that is simply that, first of all, those nodes need to be huge to handle all the, all the stuff on it, but those literally get bogged down they do. in time, but also um, the costs rise simply because they've decided to have the chain that does all the things. Everything. And I think that architecture is fundamentally flawed for that reason. Some fe some of those features that are on Ethereum have come to Bitcoin, right? What happened? Fees skyrocketed. And it's not a uh, tool of the people once that happens. Miners love it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. And we want miners all, we want more miners and so forth. So one approach is to put all the stuff on the chain and then the chain handles it. And then if you want to do something else, you got to, you got to, you know, move funds to another chain, like yeah. you know, from Ethereum to Polygon. Fundamentally, I mean, I, I've got bigger words than I think it's bad, but I just, I don't think that the path forward for crypto is this model. And they're, they're building another one now that is just, you know, it's Ethereum, but faster. And that's the whole way I understand it. It's a, another one chain to rule them on. I just yeah. fundamentally think that's broken. That's why Cosmos... And Polkadot were definitely, in my view, far better architected. Um, yeah, you know, you got a main chain, you got nice bonds between the main chain and the side chains, um, and you do your stuff on your own side chain. But. <laughs> but, yeah, you have to add the but. The but yeah. is a big but. There's yeah, or, you, there's, you know the but, right? Oracleization. Yeah, so you can say I have a great idea and you can have a great implementation. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. It right. definitely does. But then you start breaking down the fundamentals of cryptocurrencies. You start breaking down those fundamentals. And Satoshi is our, our ultimate guide for where we start from and we extend from there. When you have oracles on there, those are centralized. There's, are, there's validators. Those are elected. There's side chains, but it's a parachain kind of situation. You have one chain subservient to another chain. Every decision made on one chain isn't really real unless it's mined back to a main chain. There's all these layers of separation. This has been a topic that have, has come up lately, is that every time you keep adding layers, but you keep forcing it back into the throat of the main chain, everything starts to break down. You, either your sovereignty or your freedom or the flow or the ultimate goal. All of those are great technologies, but what this is, is something totally, it's totally different. That's important to understand that all those models, first of all, they, they try to address some big limitations that, that we face in, in yeah. blockchain. So one of the limitations is the scalability. That's what Rob was mentioning with the fees. It is obviously very difficult to do everything on one chain and then ever growing. Obviously, you will hit a wall very soon. And that's what we can see in the most used uh, currencies. Uh, the fees are just awful. You don't even want to move your money around. So it gets very difficult. The second thing is interoperability. Um, the ability to interact with other blockchain, expand the ecosystem instead of being stuck on one chain. And all those things basically try to address that. They all take two different approaches, approaches that we're not taking with, with the, the DV side chain. So those two approaches are either uh, smart contracts through ZK rollups or security through the validators of the main chain. These are the two models that you can find on one model. Basically, the communication between the different layers goes through a smart contract on each layer, right? And then you can have all records that are in between to get external data to validate this data. And then the Cosmos model, where the side chains are basically reliant on the validators of the main chain, and all the system is basically interdependent and it is very limiting and obviously it has it, it carries some security issues if if one is infected then the whole the whole network can be infected while with the dv side change we actually come with some ideas that that completely uh, annihilate that risk yeah I, I think we could spend a little bit of time i think you described that well the way that it's done now on ethereum if i move from ethereum actually there's been a history which is important i think is that 
there's a project called Rootstock. Basically, the main coin is supposed to be Bitcoin, but it's an EVM, uh, like Ethereum. And you move money on Bitcoin into an address, it's the multi-sig address, and then there is this bridge, right? And that bridge is essentially, it's controlled by some people. Uh, obviously there's automation now, um, but originally it was just controlled by some people. And then they printed coins on the EVM that represented the vid Bitcoin such that the Bitcoin on the EVM is supposed to be one-to-one -to, -one to the Bitcoin on the main network. That model is most of interoperability. It's gotten better. Right, absolutely. So the newest method you mentioned, ZK rollups, they're implementing those. That is probably the most secure way that you can do that same bridging now. And then the other thing that they do is not to have a single path. IBC is one of them for Cosmos. If you are part of the IBC, if you adopt the IBC technology, uh, it's basically a smart contract on one side, smart contract on the other side, and then a network of nodes that move the information back and forth. There's a couple other ones that are escaping me at the moment, but those are the big ones. Uh, the upcoming layer zero is another one. There's many, 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 and a growing number of these solutions that are all the same. Many flavors, but all, yeah. all the same model. All, yeah, all, all, the, all same. the same. And so, and so we should call, uh, so we call that trust minimized, right? Because you're still trusting the smart contracts on either side. You're trusting, you're trusting the code that's in the networks. There's still yeah. trust there. And somebody still is in charge of the, of where you put the funds. I mean, so, and I really want point. to highlight that word because you will hear it a lot, DCICO. Because yeah. they're trying to basically still move forward. That's what I was saying, where the innovation has to move forward. And so they are trying to pass this technology for the trustless version. Exactly. So remember the difference. This is trust minimized. This is not something yeah. you will hear about DV sidechains. So this no. is why we're highlighting in, that in part. Fact, in fact, the first question you can ask is, is there a smart contract involved? <laughs> you can just ask that. And then you'll understand the difference between a trust minimized and trustless. To make this simple, if, if you're a coin owner and maybe you're getting involved in projects or maybe you're buying hardware or maybe you're going to participate in their validator, whatever you're going to do, read those key words. Those key words that they've written have been chosen specifically. Trust minimized means you have to trust me. That's all that means. It means, yes, it's minimized because of something. It's no different than somebody saying, I'm not going to store your unencrypted private keys. Well, what does that mean? Well, it sounds like I'm saying that I'm not going to store your private keys. That's not what that says. I'm going to store your private keys, which means I have to encrypt them to store them. I'm just going to store them encrypted. So you, you still don't have a trustless situation it's a trusted situation uh, yeah but i don't want to nick pick people they got a great product but I, it's just the farce of the marketing there is another situation we're talking about i was reading about a hardware device today and that device is promoting how it doesn't store your private keys you read the key words it says private keys never saved or it says does not permanently store your private keys. What does that mean? Clients don't read that. They read those words and they're thinking, oh, my private keys are never anywhere near this device. It's sterile. Yeah, I think one was uh, we don't store unencrypted private keys. Yeah, they don't store <laughs> unencrypted private keys. Exactly. Well, these other devices will tell you, oh, I don't store your private keys permanently. Oh, my goodness. Reread those words. That's the way some of these blockchains are deploying some of these smart contracts. There is trust involved. It's trust minimized, which means, yeah, you sure you're not giving over everything and walking away and hoping to get something back. There is some layer of, I don't want to say it protections in there, but we'll, we'll call it stop gaps or whatever. But the fact is, is that something bad in many cases has happened. And Niggs, you produced a report not too long ago about these platforms that are smart contract platforms that have been manipulated. These are trust minimized platforms. You're getting involved in these platforms and these people are losing stuff. This is a common thing. It's been happening That's with right. smart contracts. We're talking about more than 3 billion lost in just a, a few years. 3 billion lost.
let's talk a little bit more about uh, our DV sidechains. Absolutely. I think you, 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 you were going to segue into that, Neeks. But who's, who's the best to speak about Divi sidechains? If we had one person in this conversation, yes, Rob and I can speak knowledgeably about Divi sidechains. It's you, Neeks. <laughs> you are the one behind Divi sidechains. We're not talking about random string. He is the brainchild. But sidechains come into being because of all the progression past vaults, past all of these other features in, in cleaning the code. But when we finally get into the smart contract period where, where Random String built those, all of a sudden, boom, Neeg says, can we do this? Yeah. And that's where sidechains begins. I can't speak to sidechains more than you can. <laughs> that's true. So let me maybe start with that. So the day Random String came to me with that idea I, that we actually could potentially connect a sidechain to, to DV. Trustlessly. That's the important part is the connection's trustless. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. So first of all, I was amazed because this is really something that completely expands DV's capabilities to, it's basically unlimited. And we'll talk about that, talking about the sidechain capabilities. But one of the things that he told me was that those sidechains, they didn't need to be dependent from the main chain. And they could also support other assets. And when he told me that, I understood that the way blockchain was working today, the way actions and operations were rendered by Uniswap or any other service that are currently running on blockchain had a chance to completely change the way they are deployed right now. Sidechains basically offer that opportunity because the way they are they're made, basically, so it's a completely custom-made blockchain. It is a custom consensus protocol, so it would be extremely lightweight, extremely efficient. And what it does is that it completely isolates the risk. Let's say if you would have a risk on that sidechain, it would never contaminate another main chain. It would exactly. always be contained uh, in its own environment. Random string designed these specific on-chain kind of smart contracts, they are 100% trustless. We heard people don't really care about trustless. Here is something that we've seen. All the industry is spending millions to be able to call their technology trust minimized. Billion. Yeah, that's crazy. Every time, every time there is a hack, those trustless technologies are ahead. Every time they, they show a much better offering than, than those trusted mm -hmm. or trust minimized solution with which the current models are expanding the, the functionality of the existing blockchains. Our technology is actually offering the expansion without the cost. Those side chains are extremely scalable. So let's say you would enter into the same kind of issues that you face with Ethereum. You would have a situation where uh, the sidechain would have too high fees or it would be too slow or you would have any other problem. It would take really a very short time to just spin up another sidechain. And then now you have the volume that is spreading among those two sidechains. And then you can have the ecosystem expanding forever. It is not limited to one blockchain and you can have basically your decentralized app they are currently on smart contract, but instead on its dedicated sidechains. One of the things that it also offers is the adaptability. A sidechain, as I was saying earlier, it has a custom uh, a consensus protocol. And so because of that, it really offers all the possibility that are feasible today and also anything that will be coming tomorrow. These sidechains don't require to be talking the language of the Ethereum blockchain or the Bitcoin blockchain. They can have their own mechanism. The technology that Random String developed is the way those connect with the main chain. And this is totally independent from the internal functionality of the sidechain itself. So it really offers a world of possibilities. And the last thing I wanted to highlight is the opportunities that it offers. First of all, the opportunities for validators. So 
validators like today people running staking vote will have the opportunity to secure several side chains at the same time with the same machine again with this idea of lightweight as it doesn't have to run um, a full economy blockchain at a time but just one service then those sidechain calls would be very lightweight and you will be able to run several at a time on a small machine. And you will be able to harvest fees from multiple sidechain at a time. Exactly. And for the devs, as I was saying earlier, a lot of opportunities in developing new technologies, but also developing competing technologies. The advantage of being able to copy a sidechain, change some things, bring a new approach, lower the fees, will definitely boost competition and boost the opportunities for, for devs and, and businesses alike. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's so, so the, the goal in, in Rob, I guess you can interject too, is the fact that the side chain technology will be a recipe. It will be in some ways be templatized. It will be something that lives on chain. It will be something that community members can participate in. Um, but it makes it, it, the utility is then made easy to build these things that keeps this trustless, but utility focused environment, but not just that it keeps it lightweight. It keeps it flexible. It makes it so anybody can do it. And you're right. The more people who do it, that increases competition, but it also increases innovation. That's the key thing. One thing I would add to this, and you guys have over the years heard my frustration is like, I want to do something with Divi that isn't custodial, right? Like a, you yeah. know, a few years back, sorry to tangent a little bit, but you know, we had that guy doing the, uh, the syrup thing. We had other people doing like providing services yeah. right, in exchange for Divi. And in fact, what the issue is, is that Divi is a lot like Bitcoin in this way is that it's use case is money, right? There's not another use case. And so when we keep wanting to do things uh, with Divi, and we want to do these cool things. We want, you know, we want people to do it with their wallets or whatever. But the fact of the matter is Divi without side chains is just money. It's and a value it, transfer. And it's the same for Litecoin. It's the same for all of these other, other blockchains out there that don't have smart contract capabilities. Now with these, the whole, I want to do something with Divi is, yeah, go ahead and do it because we get smart contract utility. But we get the security of moving funds into what would be a smart contract. We move it into a side chain. Instead, you do that without any fear. That move of funds from main chain to side chain, that's yeah. sovereign. It's yours the whole way. <laughs> and the main chain core remains lightweight. Yeah, like that's correct. also a very important part. Like the whole ecosystem remains lightweight. It remains accessible by everybody. Yeah. That, that's a very important part. I think one thing that we didn't mention is that the side chains have their, I mean, I said it earlier, but they have their own set of validators. So that, that makes a really, really strong ecosystem where everyone really takes part. And the way it works is that those services generate fees. And so those fees is basically how everything is founded. When people go on the side chain, they exchange something, they buy something, whatever is the service that is offered there, they basically generate fees that are distributed. So it is depending on whoever deploys the side chain, but there would be like a general model where some of the fees go to the validators and some of the fees go to the deployer, at least for a temporary time to make sure that there is always new development. There is always new side chains coming and we have basically a healthy system. One of the things that I uh, miss in Bitcoin world, not necessarily Divi because it's relatively inexpensive with low fees, as we get this entire economy growing and building and you know, we can't expect it to remain as inexpensive as it is now. So what I used to lament, certainly in other chains, is like we've lost, in terms of crypto sphere, We've kind of lost this idea that anybody can just go buy a computer and participate and it's easy. That element of the entire environment, not just Divi, just out there, is mostly lost. We talked before about how it, it you know, the main chains, it, it's almost impossible to run your own node, Bitcoin definitely. And so now when we get a growing ecosystem and it, you know, maybe main chain fees go up there, who knows what happens with price, but what's cool now is that anybody anywhere can participate in all of these other services. With smart contracts, you can't. Smart contracts, yeah. the guy who owns that, the guy who deployed it, that's them. You don't have 
Hey, you're not supporting it. You're not doing anything. If you want to support something on Ethereum, you're going to run an Ethereum node. You can't. I mean, some people can, but yeah, most people can't. Um, yeah. With us, with this model, you want to support the liquidity pool. You want to support the, I don't know, airplane ticketing uh, uh, network. You want to support those things. Run a node. You're in. <laughs> like run a node. You're in. So, so yeah. you know, uh, just so I clarify, a person can run a full node on Bitcoin, but not a miner. That's the validator on Bitcoin. The validator on Bitcoin is a miner. Fair enough. Um, it's, so a validator on Ethereum used to be just proof of work. Now it's proof of stake. It's a type of a miner. Uh, well, maybe not. It's it's a uh, Anyway, I won't digress, but that's not exactly true. Um, the point is, is that to do many of these kinds of things, it's difficult for the average person. They either need to have somebody do it for them or they need to pay somebody to do it for them or they need to be participating in some sort of a pooling mechanism to be able to get any benefit at all. Some of it has to deal with time, money, and trust. And that's the portion that we're trying to take away and remove from the system. Or actually, that's even a poor statement. We are not putting any of those things into the core. Random string is very focused on you as a coin owner and respecting your sovereignty and respecting your censorship resistance, respecting those things that I talked about, the reason why I joined crypto in the, in the beginning years was for those principles. He embodies those same principles. So everything that we're doing, A, is beneficial to the coin owner. I say we, it's not me. It's all, all everybody who's participating. Everything that we do as a community running this blockchain it keeps the users freedom centered. The features and functions of utilities are lightweight. They're going to be easier to use, deploy. Maybe not grandma easy in some cases, but it's going to be easier. I'm just going to be clear because that's complicated yeah. stuff. It's it's going to be clickable. It will be you know following the steps because these are super uber complicated. We just need to make the flows as a community. We need to stay focused on developing that. Now, side chains make Divi interoperable with any chain. So there's lots of things that can happen with these utility functions and side chains that makes Divi and other communities very excited about maybe some sort of interoperable situation like that. So I think that that's great to mention the ease of use it means other people can do those kinds of things partnering with divi and doing that and maximizing their potentials too yeah i think it's a good point that you bring the the easy side because while easy is not is not going to remain the, the central point of divi divi is going to get wider we're not abandoning uh, this mindset so the side chain while obviously not going to be accessible to grandma or people who have no experience with computer or we wouldn't recommend we will still provide a set of tools to make a lot of the things easier like deploying a base side chain will be pretty easy we will have a website models Absolutely. it will be extremely easy to to achieve that now of course if you want to achieve a higher level of customization then there will be the solution a solution to hire a group of devs like it happens for smart contracts and then get more modifications but we'll still get the the first level extremely accessible for for everybody we have um, one of the great things that we can benefit from is that the whole industry um, is trying to achieve those services uh, through other means and while we connect differently we're still trying to achieve the same goals and a lot of the things that have already been developed we don't have to start from scratch we can reuse that we can improve it and it really gives us a lot of work that has already been done and we can focus on our own approach while improving and implementing tools that are already been developed yeah, yeah. In the next um, in the next lives, we will also look into some specific use cases. We have a lot of those. Once again, we we benefit from things that are already in place, and also some some unique ideas that that don't exist yet and that are only um, enabled by the existence of of side chains. One of those things is. Um, 
having a decentralized model of infra. And so that would be interesting to, to look into that next time. Well, I told yeah. you the DAO is a perfect place for that also. I mean, we're, we're not going to implement That's it true. that way at first, but it'd be nice if, you know, there's a whole side chain just dedicated to that. And um, exactly. I, mean, I'm, I, I can't wait. We, uh, we've got like a dozen right now ideas that we, you know, that are great for side chain. There's obvious ones, right? Uh, like an EVM on a side chain, but honestly, that you know, it it kind of defeats the purpose. <laughs> it's you know? not to please people. It's yeah. not to please the people who don't look beyond, right? right? Like we, you just want to have that to to have yeah. it. But realistically, it it will like the model of side chain will make that EVM chain all tech. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. the that's the yeah. idea. And it might be a good like here and now thing. Um, the other neat thing about side chains actually is if, if something is not popular um, or or whatever, um, first of all, people who want to do validation on that side chain, they'll go away, right? If it's not making the money, they'll go do something else and it'll get smaller and smaller. And then you it's can a just free, take it it's down. It's a free market. It's a free yeah, market. Right. But if, if, if that's what happens, you can just take it down. There's no remnant on our main uh, on our main blockchain of it at all. It literally disappears. There isn't a bunch of stuff. There's no transactions from it on the main chain, except for moving funds in and out of it. Like all of that bloat goes away. The, the, yeah. All of the work uh, that's associated with this failing, you know, side chain goes away. Meanwhile, in the other direction, there's going to be this um, fun little game that happens, right? Because uh, look, there's this, there's this uh, side chain, it, you know, it's for video games, it's adopted, everybody's using it, everybody, and it's making a lot of money. People are going to point their nodes there, right? And now, again, the profitability versus the number of nodes on it and the cost of running this is going to level out somewhere. It's going to be this really neat kind of game of watching that that will be really fun to watch once we get these things out there for people. I, I like that part of it also. That's really nice. Yeah, I, I'm re I can't wait. Right. One thing that we understood is that if we want people to develop with TV, develop around TV, they have to basically win with us. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. not. It shouldn't be just them giving it to us for free, and and so that's why those mechanisms that the sidechain bring offers win-win opportunities all over, yeah. and so that's why we we really can't wait for that. And, and yeah, that great time. I don't even know if we, we delineated that well. Like, does everybody understand that, that it's divvy on all these side chains? <laughs> like all this, all this utility, you know, you, that's, now you're using divvy for all of that stuff. They could also put coins on it, their own yeah. coins on them if they want to, but there will always be divvy on those chains. That's anything a... that's new, anything that happens, small, large, popular, not all, all of that stuff that happens out there, um, it doesn't need its own coin. It can just use Divi. If they have a reason to have their own coin, then yeah. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of utility coming to the Divi coin itself. I started this off with, you know, yeah. I wanted to do a thing with Divi and you can't. It's just money right now. That's all it is. When you, when you give it all this other utility that, um, you know, that are, is currently deployed in as, as smart contracts elsewhere, those almost always also have their own coin to do the thing. So now you're needing Ethereum and the coin to do the thing. Right now with this model, it's just Divi. You know, it can be something else, but it's just Divi. Our excitement is hard to convey. So I get a little lost in my enthusiasm for saying this stuff and trying to describe this stuff when I got a thousand other things about why these are good or why the system is far superior to the current systems out there. This is the best way to do this. Trustless is the best way to move funds. These types of side chains are the best way to have an entire economy that attaches to other chains, maybe. Like, yeah. You don't need a central hub. You don't need these smart contracts. You don't need, it's, it's the right way to do crypto. And we're going to see over the next few years that this is, this is the way that's going to be copied. This is the way that it's better to do yeah. it. It's safer to do it. And, you know, we got this. Thanks, Random String, for for bringing us this technology. I hope one day we will we'll get him. We'll get him. Oh, on the, that would be on so great. Yeah. 
in reality, we could talk hours about this technology and we will have many other opportunity to, to do that. Um, I think, I think it is a good time to, to yeah. close the, to close the actual yeah. segment and the whole video. So what yeah. do you think guys? Uh, I think it was a great one. I think one. so. I think so. I really enjoyed it. And of course we'll look yeah. to speaking with everyone, question. uh, in the spaces afterwards, make sure you have your questions um and and post them please don't be shy please ask questions we're here to help we're here to pop be on discord pop them on discord we're, okay. we're only a few people this is about you and us all of us as a team everyone's a member of the team working together so if you have questions just ask we'll help and then whatever you learn that you find value in please absolutely share and I think we have to do that. Uh, like, subscribe, <laughs> or share, uh, do all, yes, of that, yes. all the things. Do all the things. Yes. <laughs> Please like and subscribe, just share, click the like button. Yes, do all those kinds of things. Thanks, everyone. Yes. See you next time. All right. Bye-bye now. Thanks.